Welcome to the UK Travel Planning Podcast. Your host is the founder of the UK Travel Planning website, Tracy Collins. In this podcast, Tracy shares destination guides, travel tips, and itinerary ideas, as well as interviews with a variety of guests who share their knowledge and experience of UK travel to help you plan your perfect UK vacation. Join us as we explore the UK from cosmopolitan cities to quaint villages, from historic castles to beautiful islands, and from the picturesque countryside to seaside towns. Hello and welcome to the podcast. This week we're going to be talking about essential tips to plan your perfect trip to London. London is one of the most popular tourist destinations in the world and certainly the number one destination for visitors to the UK. If this is your first time visiting London, it can, however, feel quite overwhelming when it comes to planning your trip. You may be wondering when is the best time of year to visit, how many days to spend in London, how to plan your itinerary to include the sites, attractions and landmarks on your bucket list, where to stay in London and what to budget for your trip. These and a myriad of other questions can make planning your visit seem complex and just too hard. After not only living in London, but also visiting the city as a tourist many times, In this podcast, you will hear my practical steps and travel tips to help you plan your London trip to reduce stress and overwhelm. Step one is to decide when to visit London and for how long. London is a world-class destination at any time of year and deciding when is best to visit will really depend on what you want from your trip. When evaluating when to visit, consider your budget, what you want to do, what weather you prefer and if there are any events you particularly want to see. If you prefer warm weather and longer days, then the summer months of June to August are generally the best, though this is also the busiest and most expensive time of year to visit. Popular summer London events, such as the Chelsea Flower Show, the Treatment of the Colour and Wimbledon, also lead to an influx of visitors. London is generally at its wettest and coldest from December to February, when snow can sometimes fall in the capital, but don't count on it. London in December is also always busy, and if you, like me, can't resist the beautiful Christmas lights, markets and shops, Keep in mind that the weekends before and after the holidays are the worst. Thousands of visitors throng the streets and can fill the underground stations. If you panic in crowds or in confined spaces as I do, I recommend really avoiding the underground around this time, particularly around Oxford Street, Piccadilly Circus and Covent Garden. If you plan to visit London in winter but want to avoid the busy season, you will find January and February is quieter. As it is low season, prices are lower too. So do bear in mind that hours of daylight are shorter. Weekends, public holidays and school holidays can also be busy in London, especially around popular shopping areas such as Oxford Street and Covent Garden. Museums and art galleries can also be more crowded than usual. Public holidays, as we or as we call them in the UK, bank holidays, are December 25th and 26th, January the 1st, Good Friday and Easter Monday, the first and last Mondays in May and the last Monday of August. This year, there is an extra long bank holiday weekend starting on Thursday, the 2nd of June until Sunday, the 5th of June, which is to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. And there are lots and lots of events planned across the country over those four days. If you are wondering how long to stay in London, I would say that even one day is better than nothing and two is obviously an improvement on that. If possible, though, three days is ideal, as you can see the key sites without rushing around so much that your head starts to spin. Step two is to book accommodation, and my tip is to stay in central London. While it may be tempting to book cheaper accommodation further out of the capital, I would really advise against this for a number of reasons. London is tiring, and after a long day of sightseeing, the last thing you'll feel like, believe me, is travelling to your accommodation. Staying in a central location means that you can get everywhere far faster, even on foot. This cuts down travel time immensely and also saves on travel costs. So you'll spend less money on transport, meaning that you can put a little extra towards your accommodation. I'm often asked about the best areas to stay in London. Uh, We've actually just booked our accommodation for July this year, and we're staying in the Covent Garden area. We recommend to stay around the West End, Leicester Square, Covent Garden, Soho. You can also stay close to Westminster or on the other side of the River Thames near South Bank, Waterloo and Bankside. These are all central locations with most of London's top sites within walking distance and convenient access to the tube. Step three is to plan your itinerary carefully. It is easy to overplan and overestimate how much you can do. It can also be exhausting. 
Having fun is surely the main point of taking a vacation or going traveling, so don't try to do so much that fitting it all in will cause you stress. I would recommend identifying a few must-dos and must-sees when you plan your travels to London and developing your itinerary around those. We are planning our own visit to London for later in the year and know how easy it is to try and squeeze one more thing into an already busy itinerary. When putting together your itinerary, try to group your destinations. It makes complete sense to visit a bunch of attractions in one day that are clustered fairly close together rather than being spread out all over London. Doing this saves on travel time and ticket costs. It also means you can focus on only certain parts of the city during each day, helping to prevent you from feeling overwhelmed. An example of this would be to combine your visit to the London Eye, the South Bank and Borough Market, which are clustered close together. Once you have your itinerary planned, I recommend that you book your tickets and tours in advance, especially if you are visiting during peak times. It can be difficult to purchase tickets on the day for many London attractions, such as the London Eye, for example. By doing a little forward planning before you leave home, you can save both time and money. Doing this also gets you ready for your trip, building up anticipation about the places you're about to see. I've actually just spent the last couple of nights booking most of our uh, tours in London for this July. And I am advising that people do book in advance as much as possible because it is expected to be particularly busy this summer. I'd also recommend purchasing or considering whether a London sightseeing pass is worth it for you, certainly for save your time and money. One of the most popular is the London Pass, which includes free entrance to 80 attractions in London, uh, including the Tower of London, London Zoo, the view from the Shard and many more, plus a one day hop on hop off bus tour, as well as discounts on shopping, dining and entertainment. It comes with priority entrance attractions, so you can skip the queue and avoid wasting precious holiday time. Which pass you purchase will depend on what you plan to see and do. The London Pass is a great option if you plan to see two or three of the attractions every day, but it may be a case of calculating the cost of entry to each attraction versus the cost of a pass to decide if it's worthwhile for you. Another pass available is the London Explorer Pass, where you can create your own tour of London with a pass to three, four, five or seven top attractions. Also, don't forget to include some of London's free attractions and sites in your itinerary. Visit to London is not cheap. So it's good to know that there are lots of free things to do there. Many museums and galleries are free of charge for visitors. The British Museum, Tate Modern, Natural History Museum are free, for example, and very popular with visitors. Do plan ahead, though, if there is a particular exhibition that you would like to attend, because you will have to pay for those. We have just recently booked tickets for the Stonehenge exhibition that's on in the British Museum this year, which looks absolutely fantastic. But again, make sure that you book ahead for those. Uh, The Changing of the Guard at Buckingham Palace is another popular and free attraction that should not be missed off your itinerary. Enjoy a stroll around one of London's many parks. In summer, head to Primrose Hill with a picnic for great views across the city. There are also lots of markets to visit, including Borough Market, Camden Market and Portobello Market. The Sky Garden, London's highest public garden, is another popular free attraction in London, though you will need to book a ticket to ensure entry. Bookings open three weeks before, so set a reminder on your phone or mark the date on your calendar so you don't forget. Step four when planning a London trip is to consider how you're going to get around London. We recommend using public transport, including the London Underground called the Tube. I would not recommend hiring a car and driving in central London. I speak from experience with this as I was required to drive in central London when I worked there and it was a stressful experience. It is Far easier to use the public transport system, the tube, overground trains, buses, trams and light railway. While the tube is the quickest and easiest way to travel around the city, don't use it all the time as you won't see much of London if you spend your entire time travelling underground. Also check distances between tube stations as it's often easier and quicker to walk. Covent Garden and Leicester Square are a perfect example of this. They're actually located a little over 400 metres away from each other. I do recommend booking a hop off on hop on hop off bus tour or jumping on one of London's famous red double decker buses to see the main site, as it's a great way to orientate yourself with the city. One of the top sightseeing bus routes to take is Route 24 from Pimlico to Hampstead Heath. So you can catch that bus from Victoria Station. It passes some of London's most famous sites, including Westminster Cathedral, Downing Street, Trafalgar Square, before con- continuing on to Camden Town and Hampstead Heath. 
Keep in mind that peak times of day to travel in London are 6.30 to 9.30 a.m. and 4 to 6 p.m. Monday to Friday when people are commuting in and out of London for work. It is cheaper to avoid these times on public transport and travel during off-peak for better prices. We also recommend that you purchase an Oyster card for use on public transport. An Oyster card is an electronic card that is preloaded with credit and is used to pay for public transport in London, including the tube, overground, trams, buses and boats. An Oyster card is a cheaper option than buying single-use tickets. Visit at Oyster cards are available if you are visiting London from overseas and the cards can save up to 50% off regular fares. They're accepted everywhere and you'll save you time on arrival in London. So if you're planning to travel around London, which I'm guessing you're going to be, make sure you order your visit at Oyster card before you arrive in the country as you won't be able to buy it in London. So once you've got your Oyster card, one of the most common questions we're asked is actually how do you use it? So to use the Oyster card, you just literally... Tap on the yellow card reader when you enter a station and tap off again when you exit. There's actually a maximum daily amount that you can be charged. Alternatively, you can also use a contactless credit card and tap on and off as you enter and leave tube stations. But do consider any bank charges you may occur if you're visiting from overseas. If you need to top up your card during your trip, you can do it at a station or in over around I don't know, about 4,000 shops around London. If you have money left over on your card before you leave London, you also can get a refund if it's over £10 or just keep the card for your next visit because you will be back. When using an Oyster card on a London bus, it is slightly different. You swipe the yellow card reader as you get on the bus, but you don't swipe it again as you get off. You can't buy tickets using cash for buses in London, so you will need an Oyster card or a contactless credit card if you plan to take the bus. If cycling is your thing, it is possible to hire a Santander bicycle. You will see Santander bicycles docked all around the city. These were introduced by the now Prime Minister Boris Johnson when he was Mayor of London. Bikes are charged at £2 for the first 30 minutes, but you will need to use the Santander bike app to enter your credit card details to rent one. Another great way to experience London is to take a river cruise. So I recommend jumping on a riverboat service run by Thames Clipper to Greenwich from Westminster, for example. Oyster cards are valid for use on the Clippers too, so no need to worry about buying a ticket. Alternatively, there are lots of fantastic boat trips and cruises along the Thames that you can choose from. Another way to get around is to catch a London cab. London cabs are synonymous with the capital, and taking even a quick trip in a black cab is worth it, even just once, just for the experience. London cab drivers are known for being chatty, and who knows what subject might come up as they drive you from A to B. To be a London cab driver, they will have passed a test called the knowledge. And to do this, they must prove they know the location of every street in the capital. Yep, every street in the capital, as well as the fastest route to it. That's the level of expertise you're paying for. Look for a taxi driving with its light on, which shows it's available. Stick out your hand to hail it and the driver will pull over when they deem it safe to do so. Ask them about celebrities they've driven with, because that can often lead to lots of interesting stories. Or is, as always, the British fail-safe of talking about the weather. Step five when planning your London trip is to consider where and what to eat in London. So my tip for this is to visit markets and supermarkets for budget lunches and picnic options. Although the UK may not be famous for its cuisine, London really is a fabulous destination for foodies. I would recommend sampling some traditional English food. And while this list isn't exhaustive, here are some dishes that I recommend that you try. So number one, afternoon tea. There's lots of fantastic afternoon teas available in London from a classic Ritz afternoon tea to themed afternoon teas, including one on a red London bus. Try some fish and chips, Sunday roast with Yorkshire pudding, pie and mash, strawberries and cream, a Wimbledon classic. An English pint of beer and a traditional English pub with a bag of pork scratchings. And a full English breakfast or fry up. For those of you who are more adventurous, maybe try something like jellied eels. To save money, eat a popular budget restaurant chain such as Nando's, Wagamama, Pizza Express and Cafe Rouge. If you're simply looking for a sandwich, supermarket chains such as Tesco, Sainsbury's, Marks and Spencer's and Waitrose offer meal deals. This consists of a sandwich, snack, such as a packet of crisps, and a drink at a reasonable cost. Borough Market is London's most famous food and drink market, and that offers diners a wide choice of restaurants, pubs, bars, and cafes. So make sure to add a visit to Borough Market into your itinerary too. Step six, 
is to consider adding a day trip from London into your itinerary. Please don't stay in London for your entire trip. There are many great destinations with an easy reach of the capital by train. And if you're nervous about traveling independently, there are lots of tours available, which combine two or three of the most popular destinations, such as Windsor, the Cotswolds and Bath, into a day trip. Popular day trips to the southeast and southwest of London include Bath, York, Oxford, Stonehenge, Blenheim Palace, name a few. There are also some fabulous castles near London, such as Hever Castle, the childhood home of Anne Boleyn, which make easy day trips. If you really feel adventurous, why not book the Eurostar to Paris? It will be a full day and very busy, but it is doable. I know this because my husband once met me in Paris for coffee via the Eurostar. Finally, I'd like to share some tips for first-time visitors to London. So, first of all, be careful with your belongings in London. Unfortunately, there are pickpockets around, so I would recommend using a pickpocket-proof bag or backpack when you travel. I have a selection of bags from Pack Safe and Travel On, including crossbody bags and day packs, which I always use when traveling in big cities anywhere in the world. Pay attention when withdrawing money from ATMs, cash points. Card skimming is a problem, particularly around popular tourist destinations such as Oxford Street. If anything looks suspicious, do not use a machine. If possible, only use machines in banks. Tipping. I constantly get asked questions about tipping. Tipping is not expected in the UK. Leave 10% for good service, but do check your bill in case a service charge of 10 to 12% has already been added. If you take a London taxi, round up the fare to the nearest pound. Vehicles drive on the left in the UK. Pay attention when you cross the road. Because if you're used to driving on the right, you will look the wrong way. Always cross at traffic lights and don't jaywalk. London roads are busy and you need to concentrate when crossing them. It can be very hot on the underground any time of year. In winter, shops can also be stifling. I re recommend wearing layers so you can cool off if necessary and carry a bottle of water too to stay hydrated. And lastly, visiting London always involves lots of walking. So ensure you wear comfortable shoes. So there you have it. These are my six steps to planning your first visit to London, plus some practical tips and considerations. You will find links to everything mentioned in today's podcast in the show notes at uktravelplanning.com forward slash episode four, Visiting London, as well as more resources and inspiration for planning your UK vacation. Please don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss an episode. If you're enjoying our podcasts, please also leave a review. If you have more questions about visiting the UK, pop over and join our free Facebook community at facebook.com forward slash UK travel planning. That's all for this episode. Until next time, happy UK travel planning.